Hello, this is Dr. Helen Weatherly. Welcome to our Gender GP podcast, where we will be discussing some of the issues affecting the trans and non-binary community in the world today, together with my co-host, Marianne Oakes, a trans woman herself and our head of therapy. Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to our, this edition of our podcast. Well, I'm not with Marianne today, but I have two other guests with me. I have Stephanie Hurst, who's a um, radio and TV presenter, who also has a trans history, and we're really excited to hear about um, all that she has to say about being trans, about her journey, about um, how what it's like to be such a, a celebrity um, making that journey. And then we have Dr. Simon, who's our third guest from the facial team, uh, who I think had some input um, into how beautiful Stephanie looks um, today and how feminine she looks. So um, I'm really excited to welcome both of you. Thank you for joining us. Stephanie, can I, can I pass over to you first and let you introduce yourself in a much better way than I can ever do? <laughs> yeah. Tell um, us all about you and... and over to you. I guess my story is quite classic because I think from a very early age I knew that something wasn't right and when you're at school especially like nursery school and they put the girls and the boys into different groups I was always going to sit with the girls because that was like my natural state of comfortableness they had to go and put me back with the boys now you sit over there with the boys and this happened several times they raised it to my mom but Back then, there was, there was no Google or anything like that. There was nothing, you know, my mum couldn't look this kind of stuff up. So I think she, I think she just went with a gut instinct and just ignored it. <laughs> and then as you grow up, you start to learn that this isn't, in inverted commas, uh, I guess, acceptable. Because anyone who, I guess, looks like a boy, and I guess, well, is a boy then, if you are slightly effeminate, well, you tend to get bullied. And that's what happened all through my school. And I got horrifically bullied for being short, spindly, rather effeminate, and talked about radio a bit too much. And the 1980s pop star Shaking Stevens, which again, probably didn't do me any good whilst everyone else was into Duran Duran and Spandau Ballet. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Dr. Simon, is that, um, is that a story that, well, introduce yourself, Dr. Simon, but I'm, I, I can't wait to hear, you know, is that a story that you've heard a lot? Is that the kind of classical story that you, that you come across? Good afternoon to everyone. And my name is Daniel Simon, and I am uh, one of the co-founders of the facial team in Spain. And I'm sorry for the hair, but I have the same problems than you guys. I don't have anywhere to go to cut my hair. I have been trying to do it myself, and it's not easy, I can tell you. I'm, I'm giving a lot of value to the hairdressers nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah and we have of course been working with facial feminization surgery for the last uh, almost well 13 years let's say that as facial team for around 10 years now and what Stephanie is telling is of course it's a story that we hear many times it's uh, there are many things changing I would say nowadays since you we, when we started we could say that our average patient was around 45 to 48 years old. Mm. This is changing a lot. In the last year, our average patient was 26 years old. So mm. this is also something that's showing that the transition process, the patients starting to, to have treatments or to identify uh, themselves is going to uh, starting much sooner because of information, because of family support. There are many reasons, of course. But the stories are changing. The stories are changing. We are having stories of patients that are, let's say, having uh, a little bit less difficulties during their childhood or at least more support during their, their adolescence. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's really reassuring um, to hear, isn't it, actually? And, you know, the words that you use, Stephanie, you know, horrifically bullied, not just bullied, but when, you know, to take those two words with you through your life that you were horrifically bullied. I mean, that, it makes me go shivery inside. What an awful thing to have to have to remember. Yeah, I grew up on a, um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't change this for the world. I grew up on a, a working class council estate in the north of England. And I must stress that I would not change that for the world because that made me who I am. That made me quite tough, I guess, in some respects. But because I, I, the school I went to wasn't the greatest school, I didn't have the greatest education. So I guess a lot of my education was, was self-taught. I mean, it, I did okay, don't get me wrong, but I wish I'd gone to a school that was, I guess, was a much better. But I probably, I, I probably had something to do with that as well in the fact that I found a love of radio from a very early age. And I think looking back now, my obsession with radio was 
definitely to mask the gender issues that I was having because that was taking me away from that thought process. If I threw myself into the world of radio and the obsession about my favorite DJs and my obsession about music and learning about music and artists and all sorts of stuff like that, that took my brain away from thinking about my body is wrong. So that was something that probably I may have obsessed about a little bit too much. But one of my rib cages is slightly, I must have had some cracked ribs or something because I was so... I was kicked viciously whilst on the floor. And I, I mean, I got, I didn't leave the school gates, the front of our school for gosh, 18 months. I used to stay behind and I had a wonderful library teacher called Miss Rose. And um, she'd been at the school since it first opened in the 1950s. She didn't leave until the late 90s or early noughties. She went way past retirement age. And I think she lived till she was about 102 um, and she says she's only recently passed away. And she, she obviously saw a, a vulnerability within me. And she would allow me, once school had finished, to go and sit in the library for half an hour, 40 minutes, until all the bullies had left the front gates. And then I would kind of hop over a fence or leave the front. It was just a bit of a rough school, that's all. But I probably didn't help because I was... I think kids and children always, they see the vulnerability in other children, don't they? And they see that as a target. So I was very much a target. Yeah, let, let kick, I was, because my surname's Hurst, I was Hursty. Let's kick Hursty's head in because we've got nothing else better to do today. Uh, and they'd move on to other people. So I wasn't saying I was, I was the only victim in our school, but I was, I was most certainly one of them. But I probably had a bit, and also as well, I, I had a bit of a gob on me as well, which helps as a broadcaster. <laughs> so I, that didn't help me. I'm not saying it was entirely the bully's fault, but I was, I, I, had a, I had a bit of a rough time. But I guess that's why I threw myself into the world of, of, of radio, I guess, really. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't know what to say to make, I can never make that go away, but thank you for sharing that. And I, I really hope that, that trans children and trans adolescents of the future don't have to have this, you know. And I think part of this, the work that we do and, and you know, the generosity of your time coming to, to share your experience with us is about making trans normality um, a thing of the future, which, um, which is what I've got my fingers crossed for. So thank you. Yeah, and I think also, I think schools these days, very quickly, I think schools these days, they take bullying seriously you got to remember when we were at school in the 80s it, it really wasn't they didn't take it seriously it was like oh it's and back and that was oh. it <laughs> that's what you got told to do it was it wasn't they didn't really take it seriously whereas now it is much more you know they they uh they have guidelines to do with with bullying and yeah. cyber bullying and all sorts of stuff like that so fast forwarding a little bit from school to when you met with the, the facial team. I don't want to skip anything that's, that you want to share with us that's going to be important, but I'd like to end up talking about the, 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 the help that you've had from the facial team and how, how that's helped shape your life in the way that you want it to. So without missing anything out, um, you know. I had and still have, and I'm very, I, I shouldn't say I'm lucky to have kept my career, but I guess growing up, through the time that I did and seeing how people who had transitioned were treated by the media. I, I was in radio studios surrounded by daily newspapers every single day. So I would see the press portray people who had transitioned in a certain way. So I would see a really, it was always a really bad photo from a really bad angle, sex change Charlie, gender bending freak or whatever, or the icon that is Caroline Cossey, I distinctly remember she'd been to uh, the Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg to, to fight to get her um, uh, gender legally changed so she could change her birth certificate and that she could marry. And um, I remember her, she lost that um, first case. And um, I remember the Daily Mirror leading with a double page spread of her looking fabulous. And it was double page and the headline was, this is a fella. Oh. And I distinct, and I remember seeing that, and that, that was, I was about 15 when, when I saw that. But throughout the years of being in a radio studio, having the day's newspapers, all of the red tops, and looking through them, and just seeing how the press portrayed people who had transitioned, or had come out, for want of a better word. And um, that horrified me, and I knew that that was possibly going to happen to me one day. But I, I'd got this amazing career, and... 
I didn't want to lose it because I absolutely adore radio more than anything. I love it. It's the core of who I am and music. But I knew that would happen to me. So suicide obviously came into this because I didn't, I couldn't bear losing everything and then being dragged through the press and all that kind of stuff and being hated by my friends. So there was, um, that was at the front of my mind for quite a long time to just get off the planet. I used to drive home every single day from doing my radio show. And there was a particular part of the uh, motorway where um, the carriageway going in the other direction is, is below. And I would think about turning the steering wheel into the central reservation and rolling the car down the embankment onto the other carriageway. And that was always there for years every single day, every single journey. And I knew that I couldn't do it because I knew that would, that would have an effect on other people. And I didn't want me taking my own life to have an effect on, on other people. And there was, there was several other avenues I was looking at, at, at taking my life. But then I got to a point where I was like, no, I can do this. And then I stumbled uh, in my early stages of looking and doing research and knowing that I had to transition at some point. I stumbled across the Facial Teens website and I was like, ah, this could help. This could make things easier for me. Um, so that, and in the early stages in your first website, in your first versions of the website, Dr. Simon, early on, I saw some, I saw some of the, the photos that you shared and that really helped me. And then I pressed the button. Of course, I do this uh, big interview in the UK on, on BBC Five Live. And I, I come out, I leave my daily breakfast show. I come out, I'm doing a very abridged version here. And, um, and I, I, I somehow successfully transition and everything goes okay. And the first thing on the list, and actually I was thinking about this before I did this interview this morning. Hindsight, wonderful friend always like, I wish I'd actually gone to the facial team first then transitioned. I don't know, Dr. Simon, do you find people doing that now? Do you find people coming to see you before they do transition? Yeah, yeah, we see nowadays uh, that, of course, the, the importance of facial surgery inside the transition was, let's say, a, bit, a little bit underestimated. And even on the standards of care, so on the, on the main documents generated for the uh, health professionals treating uh, transgender patients, facial feminization was considered something cosmetic. So this doesn't help, of course, as an information to, to patients or potential patients that they understand that this is a crucial part of the transition. So we had patients coming to us with SRS, so genital surgery performed, but, we, but still with a very masculine face. And this, of course, doesn't help psychologically, doesn't help with the transition. So yes, I, I believe that if, if we, we are now helping even the, the new standards of care are being written now, we are helping on the, on the face part. And we believe that there should be a sequence, just uh, I'm not telling that all the patients need to follow that sequence, but there should be a sequence, a logical one that is going to make the experience of the transition less traumatic, more comfortable. And I believe that uh, if the face can be addressed at the right time, I cannot say if it's before transition or after because it, it, this is a very gray area when the transition really starts, when it had started already. But I believe that the, the feminization surgery should not be left for last. I think it should be done as soon as possible. We normally ask our patients to be under hormone therapy for around a year before surgery because then the hormone therapy will play an important role already on the face, giving a lot of differences on the skin, on the fat distribution, even psychological patients are going to be feeling, feeling better. And then we do the facial surgery. So the ideal sequence, I don't feel, uh, I, I cannot feel like the authority to tell what's the ideal sequence. But from what I see, and we have seen many patients, doing the face in the beginning of the process helps a lot. Yeah, a friend of mine came to see you recently, um, my friend Jo, and she, um, before she actually came out to all of her friends, she came to see you, uh, you guys at the, uh, at the facial team, and she, she says it, it's completely changed her life. And I think for me, I think, when did I go? I think it was about six, eight months after I'd come out. And um, it's always weird. It's weird when you say coming out. What does that, what does that mean when you kind of reveal, hi, this is actually me? And I was doing, uh, I was appearing a lot on a TV show here in the UK on ITV called Lorraine. 
and I'd originally gone on as a guest and then they gave me a job to, we were doing this thing called change one thing, which is if there's one thing you could change about your life, what would that be? And because I'd gone through quite a change, I was helping um, mentor um, some of the people that were changing one thing. And I was doing a lot of TV and there was a particular side angle, one of the cameras, I think it was camera three used to come around and it used to get my side angle. So I would come home, sit in my living room because everything's in HD these days. I'd sit and watch the performance back from that morning show and pause it and see the side profile. Mm -hmm. And I was spending a lot of time on trains backwards and forwards. And when someone sits next to you on a train, they see your side angle if they look out of the window And this side angle I I hated. I didn't particularly have a huge bossing of the forehead, but it was was definitely there. And looking back on photos now, it's like, oh my gosh, yeah, it, 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 it made a massive change. So booking to see you guys, and I can only say, and I've I've never really spoken publicly about it. So this is a first for me speaking about my surgery and stuff. I've spoken about other surgeries. But I can only, you changed my life. You changed my life. And I can't thank you all at the facial team from my first, you speaking to Lilia straight away and everywhere through every single process, it changed my life. And it was, it was the most amazing experience ever. It was, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I think that deserves a little round of applause, actually. That was lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I mean, isn't that lovely? So Dr. Simon, isn't, that, isn't it amazing to be able to, as a doctor, to be able to help somebody so much? You know, those words are not words that we hear very often uh, in the whole of medical practice. But, you know, you changed my life. You helped me so much. You know, that's such a, an amazing thing for doctors to be able to do, isn't it, really? There are so many things that we experience uh, in our day by day that are not common in the medical field <laughs> that, yeah, it's, 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 it's amazing. I mean, uh, when we we travel and you know we we sometimes travel to see patients abroad and uh, we have previous patients like Stephanie that want to come just to say hello you know and just to see and to talk to us and of course it, it is not something that it's common it's something that it's uh, it, something special happens during the FFS I remember Stephanie it was her surgery was was some time ago some years ago but I remember very well and the the thing I think it's interesting and I think she can uh, confirm. Many patients believe that when they're going to go do for an FFS, they believe there's going to be a crazy and strong change on the face and we have to do a lot of stuff. And with her, we, we, we do what we normally do. We, we look at each face and try to identify which area really makes a difference, which area is masculine. And in many times with one or two procedures, so small touch in some areas, key areas of the face, you are able to achieve a very, very good and feminine result. And very importantly, without removing the core identity. So people that knew Stephanie before surgery, when they see her after, uh, and she herself seeing her after, she can identify completely with herself because the only thing we have eliminated is the masculine feature. And this is the key point of feminization surgery, at least modern feminization surgery. We are not trying to make a face change completely. This has another name. This is called extreme makeover. This is not what we do. We, we only want to address the masculine features. And, and uh, th- this is very, very nice also for the response of families and, and friends because they are very afraid of losing their, their relative of, to, to another face and they're not going to identify it anymore, anymore. And it doesn't happen like this. So, yeah, I'm so happy that uh, Stephanie is one, one other success patient that not only in her personal life, she's so successful, but that the surgery could also help her gain more confidence and go on with her career and, and be the, the amazing woman she is nowadays. And I, I, I thank you so much for, for this. It's true, we, we have never talked about your surgery since, since you came, so I'm very happy to know you're doing well. Oh, thank you so much. I think there was one thing that really kind of stood out for me as well, and it's only a really little thing, in the fact that when I had my first, I think it was in Manchester, no, it was in London, actually, I had my first kind of assessment and um I was booked in for a facelift so apart from the forehead contouring and the rhinoplasty uh, there was a lip lift in there as well and then I came out to Marbella and then you looked at me again and said actually no you don't need a lip lift whereas and this this for me was like you could have taken that money yeah 
Yeah. That could have been taken. That lip lift could have been done, but you didn't do it. And I thought, and you gave me my money back. And I just thought that, now, that th- these people I am working with here, these people who are working on me, these people I booked to see are true, genuine people and they only want the best and they will only do what's needed. And I thought that was just, and I remember thinking, wow. And they you transferred the money back to me. I was like, gosh. <laughs> Whereas, you know, there may be some charlatans out there who would like, yeah, have this done even though you don't need it just to make a quick book where you, you guys didn't at all. And I thought that was... That was yeah. It- yeah, it, it's it's a very common thing that, that that's why I was uh, saying this that that you you are now let's say you are you are expressing that you are very happy, and you had uh, maybe twenty percent of the whole scope of procedures that exist in mm-hmm. FFS, mm-hmm. but you are very happy, and uh, we ha- we get many patients that have that be- or they believe they need a lot, or they have been assessed by other surgeons that that tell them that they need a lot of procedures. That, and this has not one, only one consequence, of course. First, if they do a lot of procedures, the cost is going to be much higher. And second, they believe that do, if they do not uh, have all those procedures performed, they will not be feminine. So the assessment can be, can be a, 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 a problem for the patient because the patient absorbs that assessment as uh, understanding that if I don't do all this, I will never be 100% feminine. So this is the change that we see in FFS. We have to do uh, the, the, a very objective assessment where we only address the masculine features, putting procedures over procedures that don't have any sense. Or of course, I'm not going to mention the fact that a surgeon should never put a procedure on a patient uh, just aiming financial advantage. Of course, it's, uh, uh, this is how it should be done. And it, this is how we work from the beginning. I believe this is one of the reasons that we have uh, uh, we, we have grown a lot in the last years, as you know, and uh, we, we, we didn't change uh, uh, nothing about it. We, we like to give an assessment that is extremely clear to the patients and, of course, very objective so that the most potential result of femininity is obtained with the less amount of procedures. And I love the fact that you were contactable as well, whereas, you know, some surgeons you know the work is done and then you may never see them again or whatever you are contactable and I really liked that you know you speak to Lilia or other people at the first team but you will always get in contact with you you'll always get an answer back and I loved the chain of communication I loved the checkup procedure as well everything from start to finish uh, I thought it was just yeah so when I'm 50 I'm going to book back in I'm going to have some kind of faith <laughs> <on>. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah yeah sorry sorry no, I was going to say, because we, we did a, a, a podcast with Alexandra Hamer, and she talks to exactly a lot about this, um, about the importance of, of not just booking in every single procedure and, and not, not everybody needs everything. The other thing I, I just want to go back to, um, if you don't mind, is, the, is the, the, the concept of dysphoria, which is absolutely different for every single person. And you, um, Stephanie, you were explaining really well about yours was the side of your face, the side view, you know, even on a train, on every TV show that you did. And it's really interesting for me as a as a medic that there's different types of dysphoria that people have whether it might be the brow that you were talking about or the side of the face or some for some people it's their voice for some people it's their height or what have you and I think again as a as a medic trying to help it's really important to, to understand what's important for that person and it can be completely different from what society might spot or notice and very different from another patient. It's interesting that because <laughs> The things that society and other people and friends spot are completely different to what you spot about yourself. Every one of us hates something about ourselves, whether it's our arms, our legs, you know, our, my, I hate my hair. I've got loads of it. I'm very lucky, but it's fine. And it's always been fine and fairly nuclear since I was a child. Always looks like I'd stuck my fingers in a plug socket. (laughs) So that's one thing. And, but I just count myself lucky that I've, I've got my hair and I'm very black and white about some things. I go, right, what can I change? What can't I change? And I guess the dysphoria side of, of, of my face was, I just didn't like the side angle. There was actually looking at some old photos of the front of the face. I probably could have gotten away with that. Maybe there was still some bossing of the brow actually, when I look back at front on photos but I think as soon as I'd had it done and this is definitely a psychological thing and I didn't suffer a lot of bruising there was some swelling of course 
but it wasn't, it wasn't bad. It wasn't painful. I wasn't in any pain in any way, shape or form. But as soon as I had it done, it was almost like someone had, had reprogrammed my brain almost. It was like, oh, I don't have to worry about that anymore. That's gone. That, that side profile, what I was worried about has now gone. They've taken it away. And I never worried about it again. So it's interesting how the brain puts things into certain compartments, isn't it, in the brain? That's now just been put away or thrown away. I don't even think about it. So um, it's, it's a little thing, but it's massive at the same time. I would say out of all my surgeries, and everything's done and dusted, out of all of my surgeries, the facial stuff was the, the life-changing one. Absolutely, without doubt. Well, you look... Very beautiful and very feminine, as I said at the beginning. Oh, gosh, well. I mean, I've been, Helen. I've been very lucky as well in the fact that I'm five foot seven and I was, I've always been a bit, I was never masculine. I was never had big shoulders. But also after, after GRS, your body changes again. And I'd had several friends say to me, as soon as you have your lower surgery done, which is some years ago now, your body will change. And one of my friends says, oh, your back muscles will change. And I was like, Really? I says, well, I think it's changed enough, my body's. I mean, I'm quite happy with it as it is. And then slowly after surgery, the rest of my body changed again. I think it's done now. I think I'm just going to get old. Um, <laughs> and things will start dropping. But yeah, so it's, it's um, yeah, that was the, that was well, the thing. Have to do with that though. I mean, switching the hormones is a massive thing for your body as well, isn't it? Yeah, so of course that, it is. Yeah. That takes time. To, um, mm. And it's interesting because um, uh, Dr. Simon, you're talking about the, the psychological effects as well of, of changing the hormones. It's an, a very important part of, of us, isn't it? You know, our, our hormone profile kind of thing. And those changes go on. And, you know, when, when I watch my sons go through puberty and, and in their late teens, they're still spindly little lads. And through the 20s, it's still developing and developing and changing into that big, big kind of masculine thing that they're quite happy to be. But um, I, I, it's funny, Stephanie, you should, you should say that the, the thing that you, were, that you were horrifically bullied for being that spindly little lad <laughs> at school. <laughs> Actually, now it makes you five foot seven, narrow, you know, lady. So uh, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it's um, it's funny as well with the whole because I don't do much. It's rare for me to speak about this kind of stuff because I, I, and not that I've walked away from any community or anything like that. But it's for me, transition is a process. It's transitory. It's moving from A to B, transport, and I've, I've moved. I've, I've done it and I didn't want this to start to define me because I'd seen other friends and all of their waking day and everything and tweeting about it constantly and Facebooking and sharing it starts to consume you and I was like I, 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 I flew the flag for a good few years and I went I just don't want this to start to define me I just don't want to be known for this. I'm a broadcaster. I'm a human being. I'm a daughter. I'm a friend. I'm all of these, but yeah, I've got a transistor. So I decided to just go, do you know what? I'm, I'll, I'll speak about it when it feels right to speak about it. And this, this opportunity feels absolutely right to speak about it and to speak with yourselves and, and the amazing uh, facial team and, and, and Dr. Simon. But I think it's healthy to not let it define you. I think it really is because I was wrapped up in this from three years old. And as you know, do I want to spend the rest of my life in my seventies still being angry at society because you're not accepted or certain, a small percentage of society doesn't accept only because they're afraid. So I thought I could, if I can educate in an invisible way, I was just doing my job just being a broadcaster, just being on the, I'm on the radio every single day on the BBC and I never talk about it. It never comes up. I just get on with it. And I've had several of my listeners who have listened to me for years go, I've actually forgotten you were, you were anything else. And I was like, yes, fist pump. Cause that's what you want. You want people to almost forget that there was anything else. You're just you. I'm just Steph who happens to muddle away through radio shows every single day. So for me, it was just, it was just, I'll see if I can educate in a way of, of not being that person that's constantly going, you must accept me. You must accept me. Look at me. I'm female. Accept me. But if I can just do my job and go, oh, she's not, she's not weird, is she? She's just, she's just that woman off the radio. All right. Okay. 
and that's it and they move on so that's the tact that i'm kind of i'm going with and that feels right for me but for everyone else if you know if flying the flag and banging the drum is right for you do it i'm not saying it's wrong but we've all got to do things that are right for us i guess really does that make sense yeah, absolutely. And we hear, we've, we've talked to lots and lots of people. And I think it's, it's really important. It, for me, it reminds me of what we were just talking about with the dysphoria, which is different for everybody. Yeah. And yeah. about the path that you want to follow. And that can change. You know, the path that you took at the beginning was different to the path you get. Actually, do you know what? I'm done there now. I'm just going to be a female staff presenter and yeah. just get on with my career kind of thing. Whereas other people want to carry on flying, flying that flag forever. Absolutely. And so they should, if, if that feels right for them. I applaud them and I can't thank them enough for everything they're doing for future generations. But I'm still, even though you don't see me on Twitter tweeting about it, I'm, I'm, I'm flying the flag daily on the air publicly, showing people that you can make a success of your life, showing people that you can just be, just be you. Well, I mean, that's what we talked about earlier, wasn't it? It's just that trans normalcy. It doesn't matter. It's not, it's nothing to shout about. It doesn't matter. So what? Do you know what I mean? It's me. Hi, hi, I'm me. Right, what should we talk about on the radio today? Kind of thing, you know. <laughs> Dr. Simon, you mentioned the WPATH standards of care. For those of people who are not quite sure what that is, I'm just going to explain it. So, the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, they, they issue a big booklet which tells comes at transgender issues from all kinds of angles and they're rewriting the guidelines at the moment so the medics amongst us and, and the community amongst us is very very excited about what they're going to say and hoping that you know because it's been some time since they last developed um, the guidelines so it's it's really we're re really hoping that this time lots has changed um, in the last few years so dr simon what, what's the situation when are they coming out when when can we read it what's happening we're all so excited to get to get on with it the WPATH, I, I, just to clarify, right, is the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, and they have written the standards of care, the last one, which is this guideline about the, the transition process for professionals treating, tra treating uh, transgender patients. The last one is from, I believe, 2011, I think, yeah. and the, we, they have been now evolving this document for a new edition, and uh, we believe it's going to be out. Of course, we have now this moment of the crisis of the virus that is delaying everything but it, it, it should be out this year or next year and uh, we have been invited to contribute with the feminization of the face so we have been contributed to a talk about the importance of the of the of the face inside the transition process okay and uh, we from what the feedback we got up to now it's a very positive one because we see that uh, the, the way we see the feminization of the face inside transition process was really well translated in the document. And we believe that it's going to be very helpful for patients all around the world who will need this type of guidelines to justify, for example, for uh, medical insurance, for uh, even public services, that this is one of the important process inside transition. Yeah, it's interesting that you should, should, um, say that because our National Health Service, although it has, it has a list of things that you're allowed to have funded for you and that you're not allowed and you, genital reconstructive surgery is on the list of allowed things but facial feminization surgery isn't and again it goes back to that that kind of list of dysphoria you know what if that person doesn't have any dysphoria about their genitals it's just not a problem you, you know but yet yeah, but they this for example the side angle of their face is very important so I, I think this will really help be able to shape guidance in all and lots of countries around the world which is which is really good and I was uh, we were talking before um, with your team you, you know I think I just want to congratulate you from the medical point of view on the research um, and the, the guidance that you've managed to produce in the last all the years that you've been working because no, no, nothing can go forward without research and you know I don't want to talk about the lack of research that everyone's talking about because there's plenty of good research and, and I think you, you, your team has contributed greatly to that, haven't you? Yeah, we, we have been trying to, to put out the experience we have with our patients, not only regarding surgery, but regarding the type of, of evaluation, the type of exams necessary, the type of instruments that we use. We try to put this out uh, through different ways from research that goes uh, for uh, scientific articles that we can write uh, that are published, of course, in medical journals, 
to many, many, many medical conferences that we attend where we are able to talk about what we do. And this is information that is gained much more importance by the medical field. But yeah, the importance of research at the end of the day is that this is a surgery as most surgeries that exist that should be performed with a certain amount of protocol. You know, that there's a saying that if you have uh, many ways to treat one thing, it's because probably there's not one of those ways that is very good, okay? So it's always good that you try to establish some ways, at least some, some guidelines, that a way of a surgery should be performed. In FFS, it's not different. And what, when we started, what we found is that this was a very, very sparse field where you had surgeons doing things from a completely different way than the other, with uh, completely different materials. Even the, the diagnostics, it's still very difficult. Some surgeons will make a diagnostic that is completely different than diagnostics of other surgeons. So research is mandatory here. We have now published uh, recently, in the last month, an article that it's a, an article where we, we expose, after around 10 years, our protocol of evaluation. So we are just explaining how we evaluate the patients, how we make the diagnostics, which are the step-by-step -step before doing surgery. Because uh, doing articles about surgery are good as well, but we, we see that also the need of, the, of, of complementing these steps before surgery, which is also still very weak in literature. So yes, research is very important. I, I know it affects sometimes less the patients directly because not all the patients, they have access to this, to this medical literature, but it's very important when they affect the, the surgeons that want to start in this field. And, and I, I, if, you, if you see what is the current situation of FFS in the world now and 10 years uh, before, there are so much more surgeons nowadays that want to perform these procedures, they're starting to do it. And this is because, of course, of, of constant improvement in research. That's right. Um, and, and going back to that point about where the patients will be um, using this guidance, a lot of the work that we do is, is actually kind of translating medical language into everyday language, which I think is really, really important because, you know, the, 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 the standards of care eight is going to be such an important doc document. So we will be kind of translating it into readable sections. Um, so don't worry if you get, if you're a bit too technical in there, don't, don't worry. We'll, we'll, we'll make it readable. Yeah. Um, we, we need and, to be technical. We need to be technical because it's, uh, we are publishing in medical journals, but if you do, this work that you do, it, it's, uh, it's amazing because I tell you, uh, again, from what we begin the, 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 the conversation when, we, when I was saying that we see so many things that are completely different than a normal medical life, uh, we have our patients that are almost every time asking us to send them our scientific articles. Yeah. So, I mean, this is often not common. When you remember you went to a surgeon for any other problem and you said, I'd like to read some scientific articles about it. So the patients, they are so interested about this and they are so conscious about making their decisions not only about the team that they are choosing, but also about what is the current literature about the surgery, because I have to make a decision. They understand this is a surgery you do once in your life if you want to do it very well. So let's make a decision with some base, with some solid information. Yeah. The other point um, is about you made is about the evaluation. Um, and I, I've been shocked while I've been in this field about, you know, if you're not transgender, the evaluation is really about, is, is, is really about what right procedure to do and, and um, how best to do it and how, what, at what time frame to do it. If you are transgender, there's a whole great big piece of work to be done to make sure you're transgender in the first place. And it's almost like, well, why ever, why ever would they be coming to you to say, I am transgender and my face is too masculine, can you help me please? If they weren't transgender in the first place, you know? And so, you know, we at Gender GP have a big philosophy about informed consent, autonomy, uh, the patient is the expert in their agenda and you know then our medical team will just help them with their hormones you know so uh, it's, it's really important that, that the evaluation is about the medical procedure not about their transgender identity. No, I completely agree and we have, uh, we have uh, many patients that come to us in, in a moment mainly regarding their face that it's so early and they are sometimes scared to come because they think they are going to be, uh, th that is maybe it's ridiculous to come at this point because I'm still presenting myself uh, masculine and I, I, why should I come now? I have to be more feminine to come to see, to see us. But actually it's not true. We, 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 we encourage our patients that are starting a process, already identifying themselves 
uh, that being in a transition that they come to us early because we can save them a lot of, uh, let's say, thoughts that are not very, very useful to them. So, uh, we have patients that come to us and we can say like, like with Stephanie that you need that procedure and with that we'll be fine. And, but in their minds, they are thinking they need so many things that just sitting with us and ha having a clarification of when they have their surgery, what it's going to be like is already a very relaxing moment because they have something to look at and they understand, okay, when the moment of my feminization comes, I know I just have to do that. And all that movie that was on your head is going down and you are, you're much more relaxed. You know? The, um, the skull scans that you get as well, the CT scans afterwards, and you see the before and afters is fascinating. The amount of friends I've at the time, when I'd first had it done, I was showing them, I'd, I think I probably still got them on my phone now, actually. <laughs> still look at this and this is, you know, and it takes, is it seven minutes to take the forehead off? Does it take about seven minutes? Yes, it's uh, uh, the, the CT scans that we use, as you're saying, it, these are all 3D scans. And they are not only because they are amazing, because they, they indeed look amazing. I mean, anyone can understand it, the, the 3D scan. So you can see your skull perfectly high HD, almost like your BBC programs, where you can see HD, the skull. And, uh, but they, they have a very important role nowadays that not all the patients already uh, uh, know, that it's that we use the 3D scans to 3D print things. Okay? So when we are doing, for example, a jaw and chin surgery nowadays, uh, we do it all with 3D printing. It means we are able to take that scan, we put it in our planning software, we have a software that we can move the skull in the screen, and we can design the cuts we are going to make on the jaw and chin, and then this image is going to be 3D printed. So what we have at the end is a cutting guide that we can use in the surgery. So it fits only your jaw, because it's done over your scan and shows us what we are going to cut. So the 3D scans, they are not only for us to see and make diagnostics. They are now already, they have invaded completely the treatment part of the, of the surgery. Okay? It's not only pre-op or post-op, it's trans-op, intra-op. Okay? So it's very good. Yeah, when, when we do the forehead surgery, uh, we have to, to get to the forehead. Okay? So we need to get to the bone area here. Uh, we have to do a detachment. So we have to separate the skin and muscles of the forehead to see the bone. We do it with an incision inside the hair, completely hidden. And with that incision, we are able to expose all this area. Many patients, when they hear this, they are like this, you know, they are scared. But at the end of the day, the incision and the amount of detachment that we make is not larger or more broader than a facelift. When you do a facelift, which is much more accepted procedures, everyone knows what a, lift, what a facelift is, you have sometimes an incision that comes from here and go here and even to the back. And you do it in both sides. If you put them together, they are larger than the incision we do for the forehead. And the detachment for a facelift is also aggressive, where you're going to have a lot of the soft tissues of the face here completely detached. So I understand completely. I mean, it's much more, wow, it's much more powerful to imagine that we are detaching this area. But the surgery itself is less uh, aggressive than a facelift regarding the soft tissues. The one thing I did love is the fact that it's, the scar is hidden where I'd seen in my early research, people were cutting across the top of the hairline. And you can see that, can't you? So that's visible, even though the scar will fade, that is still visible. But the fact that I never even think about the fact that I've got a scar running across the top of my head. This is one of the typical points of research that uh, you have uh, some surgeons, they say, yeah, I do from here. And others say I do from here. And I mean, there's a, there's a limit where preference can play a role, you know? A surgeon can tell, I like to use that type of, of scalpel and that type of instrument, and the other likes that. But uh, th there are big differences between making a cut on the hairline and inside, and I, don't, and, and I think that the research plays a role here. You have to do what is best for the patient. So uh, the, one of our main articles, it's talking about this, when we are discussing the differences between the approaches because for the surgeon it's just a moment uh, it, it's, I'm going to see you during the surgery do that procedure maybe I'm going to cut on the hairline or here but the patient's going to leave with that incision for the rest of her life so it's a very important moment the decision where to make your incision and there, there are some guidelines and the guidelines are very well exposed in this article and I tell you that right now we are doing so rarely an incision on the hairline I think it's less than 1% of our patients nowadays that we do an incision here. 
We do most of the incisions are hidden because we are trying to keep one of the pillars we always talk about that we can make a nice change, but without visible scars. And the scars on the hairline, they are, even when they heal very well and you don't see a scar, you will sometimes see the problem of the artificial aspect of the hairline itself, because when it heals, it's not going to have that nice irregularity the hairline normally has, okay? But it's much more problems than that. Uh, you are not, if you do a hairline approach, you will not be able to change the hairline shape to a round one, and this is the goal. You only can get the hairline down with the same square shape that we see in most of our patients, or M shape. So we, I could talk about hairlines here for two hours, really. But it's just another example as how research is important in this field and that we should start to establish some protocols. Yeah, yeah I had some immediate, I had an immediate hair transplant as well. I wasn't receding much, but you gave me the option of taking some of the hair follicles yeah. and planting them back in, which I'm so glad you did. Thank you. I think it's progression as well, isn't it? I mean, there'll be some people listening who have had the hairline approach because that was all that was available to them at that time. And this, so this is about progression and about, and about, as you say, moving forward and making sure that, that what we do is important safely for medical reasons. And then, of course, um, what the patient want, wants as well. I could also talk for hours, but I think we're, we've kind of come to the end of our, our time. Um, it's been really, really nice. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for sharing your journey with us. I'm sorry that your, your journey started with that bullying and those words. Oh, it's, it's fine. Do you know, I, I, I don't even think about it. The, the good thing was that actually I got a job on the radio in the area where I went to school. So actually the bullies ended up buying me drinks on a Friday night in town. Yeah, Every cloud. <laughs> cloud absolutely but thank you for your candid um sharing of that story and for always fla flying that flag even though it's not you know your your t today's mission flying the flag every day I, I, we, we we know that you are so yeah, i'll be f i'm flying it this afternoon but i just you know i'm not talking about it but you you can hear me i'm a dj actually here in my kitchen on a saturday night and i think the the views are like hundred thousand people watching me dj in my kitchen and um, yeah, I'm always doing lots of things, bits on TV here, there and everywhere. So um, but yeah, it's, I'm, I guess I'm flying the flag invisibly. <laughs> and I think for me, you're it, it, flying for, for normalcy and whatever, yeah. Normalcy. Yeah, whatever that is. You know, uh, and, and showing that, that trans people are completely and utterly uh, normal, ordinary, acceptable, successful. Um, and, and this is the future, which is which the is thing is, we are all different. We're all Every single human on this planet comes in different shapes and sizes and every single one of us should be accepted for who we are, what we are, uh, our values are treat people the way you like to be treated, be nice, be kind. And that's all we ask for every human being on the planet, isn't it really? It's not much to us. Just, just be kind. And you, you said at the beginning, you know, when you, when you, you, knew, you knew, but you didn't know what the words were, you didn't know how to verbalise it, you didn't have, we didn't have the, the search engine to help you. But these days we do, and, I, and, I, and you know, to anybody out there who is doing that bit just before you come out, as we talked about earlier, um, you know, there's, there's lots of information out there, and there's lots of people willing to share their stories, which is always there is, and I still get, I'll get messages to my Facebook page and you know, online and through my website and I, I'll always reply back always and I'll always point people in the right direction of what the help that they need I've pointed people in the direction of the facial team and several other avenues and I'll always always help so if anybody wants to email me they can do just pop to my website um, and absolutely I'll always answer any questions that anyone's ever got brilliant and to the facial team thank you so much this has been our th the third in our series with you and it's been really informative as i said on the last two i've learned ever such a lot um, and thank you and i hope that the people listening will have, will have learned a lot as well and again i want to thank you for the, the great work you do for your patients because we've seen so many happy people and also the great work you're, you're doing for the medical progression in this field which is which is you know equally important to me so thank you so much for, for joining us well, thank you so much for inviting us and thank you so much for, for inviting Stephanie. It's uh, amazing to be able to see you here and uh, after so many years. And yes, um, we, th these are the type of initiatives that are growing more and more to, to, spread the, to spread the information, to make patients more aware. The goal of facial team uh, is and will always be to improve uh, the life of transgender women around the planet. If we, this is our main mission and if we can do this through research, 
through, uh, through improvement of surgical techniques or through improving the way that uh, we believe the medical field should treat those patients is what we are going to keep doing. And uh, the feedback we get like this, it just confirms uh, the importance that it has. And I'm so happy to hear that we are making difference in so many people's lives. Good. Let's, let's carry on flying that flag for the, uh, for the trans community. So we'll do it from the medical side and you can do it from the facial side. So uh, okay. thanks ever so much, guys. Really, really, really enjoyed talking to you. Thank all. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye now. Bye. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed our program. Do go ahead and subscribe if you haven't done so already. If you or anyone else are affected by any of the topics discussed in our podcast and you'd like to contact us, please drop us a line at doctor at gendergp.co.uk. We're very happy to accept ideas for future episodes and guests or if there's something specific you'd like us to cover. You can also visit our website www.gendergp.co.uk You can follow us on social media at GenderGP and you can sign up to our monthly newsletter. Full details can be found in the show notes on our podcast page. Thanks for listening.